Hello and welcome to INET Live. My name is Katya Klinova. I lead labor and economy research programs at the Partnership on AI. This episode of INET Live is on the future of work, and today's topic is called Making Technologies Work for All. I'm joined for this conversation by a terrific and truly multidisciplinary panel. On it today are Tess Posner, CEO of AI for All, Martin Reeves, Managing Director, Senior Partner, and Chairman of ECG Henderson Institute. And stepping in for Mariana Matsukata, who unfortunately was not able to join us today, is Dr. Antonio Andrioni, Associate Professor of Industrial Economics at University College London and Head of Research at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Welcome to all three of you. We will leave time at the end for audience questions. So to our audience, thank you very much for joining us today. And please submit your questions at any point during our discussion by clicking on the Q&A button. I'd like to start by acknowledging why today's top topic calls for making technologies work for all. It is because in the last four decades, at least when it comes to wages and employment, not everyone has been sharing on the fruits of technological advancement. In theory, technology improves productivity, and productivity growth drives wage growth. But in practice, what we seem to be seeing is that productivity growth has not been spread uniformly across wage and education levels. The technologies of the information era have been hugely complementary to people with STEM skills, managers, and the so-called knowledge workers, and that translated into wage growth for them. But the median worker hasn't been enjoying those same wage gains. In fact, the wages of workers without college degrees uh, have been stagnating and in the US even declining in real terms over the past few decades. So I'd like to invite our panelists to share where you stand on why people are getting left behind by the latest form of technological progress. Is the issue with technologies, with how we invent them, with how we govern them, with how we distribute or fail to distribute the fruits of their advancement, or there is some combination of all of those reasons? Antonia, would you like to pick up that? Sure. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me in this in this panel. Um, I think your question is a is a, a big big question in the sense that um, lots of the answers that we are going to try to give um, will have to take into consideration first of all what has been happening in terms of technological change. What are we really referring to, and how actually this phenomenon is extremely heterogeneous across within countries, across countries, and if we look at the cutting edge frontier technology countries is the rest. And of course, all these different contexts are put together uh, and integrated to a certain extent by the way in which the organizational production at the global level has, has been restructured. So processes of outsourcing and offshoring are an important part of understanding the machinery that is behind uh, this, this phenomenon. I think uh, as well, the problem is to be able to understand what has been happening within firms and business enterprises and why is that the uh, institutions that could uh, regulate these business enterprises have failed to actually uh, address a number of distortion that we've been seeing happening for, for several decades, in particular in relation to, to work. Um, I'm referring to, in particular, to the way in which um, we have been seeing the uh, dominance of a patterns of financialization in the uh, productive sector in business enterprises, not just in terms of the financialization of the global economy, but actually financialization in the way in which corporate organization, business enterprises have been uh, working in the engagement with technologies, in engagement with investment, in the engagement with the patterns of investment, reinvestment of profits into activities. We have conducted quite a lot of work with colleagues uh, at IPP, but also with scholars like William Lazzoni, who has been raising this concern, in particular in the context of the US, uh, talking about how the sustainable prosperity, the machines that generated the middle class, got broken at some point. And uh, the, one of the mechanisms responsible for that was definitely the uh, high degree of financialization that uh, a number of companies experienced and how that also trickled down along supply chains in these in these uh, uh, ecosystems of firms. And of course, this is important because 
firms who do not reinvest in their workforce uh, might be innovative to a certain extent for a certain period of time, but this is not a sustainable pattern of development, but also a pattern to uh, increase productivity. And in fact, you mentioned the productivity problem. I'm uh, here sitting in London. This has been one of the major puzzles that uh, the government has been trying to address over the years, major industrial policy plan and productivity plans. Um, and again, uh, the heterogeneity of the problem has made very difficult to address it. Uh, but of course, cannot be addressed simply as a technical problem. The technology can provide solution to lack of productivity or better organization of forms of integration. But there is a, a more uh, fundamental problem around how do we give directionality to technologies innovation to make sure that they deliver the type of outcome we want to see. And this is why at IPP we use the slogan of innovation is political, exactly to refer to this important intersection between uh, the technological change dynamics and the governance of technology and what is the role of the state in giving this directionality and shaping the direction of uh, technological change. Thank you. Can't wait to dive in more to all of these points. But for now, to, over to Pat. Hi, thank you so much for having me and thank you all in the audience for joining. Um, I think my perspective is, you know, we've seen that it's really about who is shaping and building these technologies. And we've seen that many that are most impacted by the technologies we're developing on an everyday level and including impacted by the disruptions that the technologies are causing um, are not included. In fact, are historically excluded from being part of ideating, creating, and deploying these technologies. And I think as a result of that power dynamic, the actual technologies are not representative of the wider society. And to me, the most critical um, thing to do is to disrupt that history, because if we include those that are most impacted in the downstream effects of any new technology, you're gonna get better representation of what the true impacts would be and be able to prevent those better, as well as really be able to understand what are the problems, like before we even go down the road of building something, what are the problems that we're trying to solve and why? And asking those questions with the right people in the room is really, really critical. Um, I think I work in the artificial intelligence space and we've seen that only 14% of AI technologists are women of any race and the numbers are much worse for people of color. And we've already seen, even at, at its nascent kind of development, how that has led to bias in AI technology that has directly harmed communities of color and women you know, whether it's lack of access to loans or insurance, or even misidentification by computer vision systems. And I think that this question becomes even more pressing in light of our current situation where we have COVID-19 um, and the impact of the pandemic being felt more by women and communities of color. If we look at like who the frontline workers are and who these people who are actually keeping our society together are also getting the most impacted by the economic impacts and the health impacts of COVID-19. So it's critical that we think about who is in the room in, in terms of who's making the, these decisions about what should be built, how it's built and how it's applied. And I think until we solve that, you know, no solution, whether it's a governance policy or otherwise, will be sufficient to actually ensure the technology can work for all as your opening question was. So I'm excited to dig into this further. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Martin, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Katja. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, so I'd say the, the, the question to the unequal benefits uh, is actually not to begin with that cost, but to begin with the benefits themselves. So um, I, I think my first point would be that there are benefits. So some people are skeptical about whether technology has actually driven ag aggregate productivity up. I think um, if you de-average, we, we, we see that it, it definitely is, but it's, it's very unequally spread. However, the, 
securing the benefits for a nation or a corporation is far from guaranteed. It requires organizational innovation to, to unlock that. So if you're sitting in a country that's not generating benefits, that's a bigger problem than I think a problem of side effects. Um, there are, of course, a lot of side effects. Um, and um, uh, I, I think um, uh, maybe the, one of the main ways of, of, of dealing with that is, is the self-interest of corporations, what I call corporate statesmanship, which is um, if there are extreme outcomes in terms of uh, exclusion and uh, inequality and unintended consequences, um, the, the technological innovating companies will uh, bear the cost of that in terms of regulatory overreaction and so on. So I think there's an education towards a new environment that is um, you know, more brittle with respect to unintended consequences and, and ripple effects. And the third point I'd make is that um, the regulatory issues here are not straightforward. Some of them we don't have technical solutions for, some of them we don't have regulatory uh, solutions for. For example, how do you regulate an ecosystem? That's not something that is then in, in any statute book, there's no common sense. So I, I'd say don't just act, uh, innovate. We need regulatory innovation to, to deal with these, um, these problems. And some of that actually involving technology, which brings me on to my fourth point, which is the public sector embracing technology and the nonprofit sector embracing te technology is an important part of not only dealing with the side effects, but uh, dealing with uh, widespread uh, benefits. And that's also necessary, I think, to prevent regulatory asymmetry, whereby the uh, governments are, are, are not really... Um, savvy or um, uh, competent enough technologically to actually uh, be precise and effective in their interventions. Um, my fifth point would be don't just focus on technology. Um, let's imagine, for example, a technology where um, AI helps to judge people in courtrooms. Um, the effectiveness of that technology depends upon the broader socio-technical uh, te system. Um, so how the technology uh, is, is used, how it's communicated, so I think we have to look at technology in context and not think that the, uh, the object here is, is, is technology narrowly defined. Um, my, and then I'd also stress that um, it would be nice to believe that there's one primary problem here, but actually there are many specific problems, um, uh, bias, unintended consequences, um, uh, instability of highly connected systems, um, trivial uh, uses, um, financialization, privacy, um, each of these requires a different intervention. So I, have to, I think we have to be very specific about which issue that we're looking at. And then the last one I'd say, uh, it may be fashionable to attribute many of our um, ills to, uh, to, to technology, um, um, but, uh, but actually um, some of what we're talking about today may be a coincidence. In other words, we have seen a trend towards the, um, uh, the, the, the financialization of, 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 of corporate activity. And um, more recently, there's been a, a, a counterweight to that in terms of a stress on purpose and, and materiality. But we might be here dealing with a, a coincidence of issues in a sense here. We, there may be broader issues of uh, the revival of business ethics, the updating of business ethics, purposefulness, um, the next generation of thinking on corporate social responsibility. And some of that might have happened, uh, some of the inequality we're talking about today and the polarized consequences of technology may have happened even without the uh, technology, uh, in, in my view. So it's a, it's, it's a very big and, uh, and, and complex uh, agenda, I think. It is indeed quite a list, of quite a complex agenda. I'm really looking forward to discussing more of the corporate statesmanship questions and uh, what that should look like in the future. And as we begin to think about the future, I'd like to invite you to reflect on our most recent past and the K-shaped jobs recovery uh, with the COVID shock that we're seeing. Uh, data shows that high wage employment saw a much smaller dip uh, to start with after the initial lockdown began in spring of last year and then recovered just after a few weeks after that, while low wage employment both uh, experienced much deeper shock and still remains um, quite a bit under the pre-pandemic levels. And of course, who was able to keep their jobs and who wasn't often was determined by what kind of technologies we had available. So it just turns out that the computer age has prepared higher wage workers so much better for this pandemic, equipping them with the tools to stay productive at home, to telework, 
uh, but those technological advancements evidently uh, were not enough and did not um, benefit the lower wage workers in the same degrees. Sometimes actually their jobs were made more precarious and harder to keep in a context like a pandemic when many people needed more flexibility to balance their professional and their family commitments. So my question to you is dreaming about the future and thinking about the future going forward, what can we do to incentivize creation of technologies that would uh, help all people, especially the more economically vulnerable groups, to better weather the next shock, be that the climate crisis, the next pandemic, or something else? Um, yes, would you like to, to keep us off? I think you already started talking about these uneven impacts from, from the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. It's a really great question. And it's one that's I find deeply troubling because if we look at, you know, on the one hand, we're praising what we're calling essential workers who have basically kept the world going. I mean, none of us would be able to sit on Zoom, get our delivery food or whatever it is, um, get our groceries delivered and, and remain safe, you know, kind of sheltered and privileged from from getting the brunt impact of that. And if we look at who the essential workers are, 45% are women and people of color. And so what we're seeing is those impacts will be felt and are already felt um, predominantly by certain groups. And so I think, again, that comes down to exactly what you said, which is that a lot of the technological innovation has been benefiting those that are already privileged and those that have um, those jobs that already pay well and are, are benefiting certain segments of the population. Imagine if we had the reverse, where all of the solutions were being developed with those workers in mind, with the essential workers in mind. And it really shows us, I think, the experience of it, of what we're going through, really proves that point that it's all interconnected. The essential workforce we're saying is essential, <laughs> because it's really holding up the rest of society. And so if we're you know, creating the innovations with that group in mind, it's not just gonna benefit them, but it's gonna benefit everyone and the entire fabric of what holds our economy together. To me, one of the biggest issues is you often don't have those people represented in the creation process of the technology. And I think that is a multifaceted problem that goes back to education, um, history of historical exclusionary practices and discriminatory practices that exclude certain people from, from that process. Um, but you know, you see it starting in middle school and high school where you're not having equal access to exposure to technology, um, access to role models and mentors, and therefore that pathway, that access pathway into being part of the creation process is so limited. It's such a narrow pathway. And then even if you make it onto that pathway, once you make it, there's all these barriers because the current system isn't set up to actually welcome and include those folks that aren't included now. So I think it's a, it's a deeply systemic issue that's historically entrenched in a lot of different factors, including racism and the history of marginalization, especially in the U.S., if we're looking at that specifically. And we really need to focus on that because I think, imagine what it could unlock if you had more people represented in that creation process and are thought of as the innovators and creators rather than this group of people who are making decisions for everyone who will be affected, which I think, regardless of the intentions of that group, will always be limited because they represent themselves and a homogenous group of people. So I think to me, to solve this problem, the essential thing is to focus on the inclusion of who is shaping and making these decisions. Thank you. Martin, would you like to return? Um, yes, yeah, so, so on the question of um, what we can do about excluded groups, um, I think this applies at different levels. So, so the level of uh, a nation, uh, the level of uh, different sectors of society, and then within uh, individual corporate networks. So, the level of a nation, I'd say, it's very important that um, 
whole nations and economies don't uh, don't get excluded. And so I think the science and technology policy becomes uh, essential. So I think uh, to make that specific, I think Europe has to think very hard about um, how to be competitive in a uh, in, in in a world where advances in AI are. Uh, largely being driven by uh, China and, uh, and and the U.S. Otherwise, you have um, whole societies of uh, ex excluded uh, people. Um, I think um, uh, at the, the the level of uh, the different classes in society, I think we have to think about the nature of employment. Um, so it's likely that um, the AI revolution will uh, essentially commoditize uh, white collar work. Uh, much of what is 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 high paid today. Um, uh, may simply um, not be required in the future. There's huge economic sense, uh, incentive to uh, reduce employment in, uh, in certain pro uh, professions. Uh, and so actually, I do worry about the high um, earning. In the, in the very short term, we may have these marginalized groups. So I also worry about the, the relevance of the current skill set uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the higher paid workers, prof professional workers. Um, so I think that requires thinking about um, rethinking education, basically. Now, uh, the education system is, you know, known for its huge inertia. But we, the, the pace of technological uh, movement and, and the nature of work is is moving very fast. So I think we need to move to a more sort of real time, as needed, and, and completely rethought uh, educational agenda for uh, for managers. In particular, in relation to AI, I think we need to think about the unique, uh, the uniquely human activities that. Um, uh, the machines cannot um, uh, take over, um, things to do with creativity and empathy, as well as thinking about tech savvy and rethinking uh, education uh, from, from that perspective. Um, then within corporate um, uh, networks, um, actually within those people that may in aggregate appear to be doing well, um, you know, elite uh, corporation workers and so on, uh, we've, just, we've just been doing some research on, on who within those networks is doing well, and actually you find huge uh, inequalities within uh, corporate networks. So basically, working from home, digital working, has been um, in, in aggregate um, a, a much smoother transmission, transition uh, than we might have imagined. Um, but it has focused uh, uh, meetings and communications on people that already have well-established networks. So, for, so new recruits, um, uh, mavericks, uh, brokers between um, different parts of a corporate network, people that are not central to the corporate network, basically uh, you can see their communication patterns are being excluded. And the cost of that, of course, is not only the exclusion of those groups, but uh, it essentially reduces the social capital and the future innovation potential um, of an organization. Um, so we need to um, rethink um, how digital networks work and the, how we can capture that serendipity uh, and that broader set of interactions that are essential for the longer term um, health of the uh, of, of the corporation, um, but I, I won't repeat uh, what Tess said. But I, I also very much think that uh, the way to get a lot of these things thought about in the first place is to have um, a very diverse workforce that represents the, uh, the the broader society, because you will be you know raising the issues at the beginning of the innovation process that then become part of the solution in terms instead of developing uh, more narrowly targeted te technologies and then bumping into uh, tricky exclusion phenomena uh, down the line. Yeah, thank you for raising this concerns. Chris, would you like to respond to that real quick before we go to Antonia? Yeah, if that's okay, that would be great. Um, I just wanted to agree with something that you said, which I think um, just to offer one data point um, at AI for All. So, what we do, we're a nonprofit organization that focuses on education programs um, in artificial intelligence for groups that would otherwise be left out. And we work with actually 18 universities to host high school students and college students to really build their skills in AI. But to really build on your point about education, one of the things that we believe is really critical is this really focus on future-proof skills Right, because when anyone enters the workforce, the shelf life of skills is shortening. So even if you learn, you know, one programming language, by the time a high school student makes it to the workforce, who knows what that's going to look like? So it's so important to think about critical thinking, empathy, and really getting students enmeshed in the sense of like what the 
societal implications of technology are and ethical frameworks and things like that to get them to engage in those questions early because that is, those are the types of skills that you're going to need to answer some of these bigger questions. And I just wanted to offer this as, as one data point that what we're seeing is that when you approach it that way, young people get really fired up about what kinds of solutions they can get involved in based on what they care about. And I think that that also helps unleash their create, creative potential and that innovative potential that's really untapped. And so it has that multiple benefit of being this future proofing skill set that will basically serve someone throughout their whole life as they have to learn new skills um, ongoing as the economy changes, but also brings out that innate potential to think about new creative solutions with that thinking. So I absolutely agree with you that you know the education system needs to be rethought in context of this. And that will have tremendous benefits, not just for ensuring that workers can keep pace with the changes, um, but also really thinking about how to empower them with the agency to become creators, because we're going to need that in the future with the kinds of challenges that we're facing over the next few decades. Um, so I just wanted to offer AI for All as a, an example of that, where we see over 60% of our alumni starting projects, AI projects in their communities to solve problems. These are high school students. So imagine what we could see if that was done on a massive scale. It would be beyond what we could comprehend. If I could just briefly respond to that. Um, Tess, I'm unfortunately, I've got a memory like I said, and I can't remember the name of the startup. But uh, one good piece of news here is um, there are a number of startups that um, train um, uh, um, underprivileged groups. Um, you know, people with um, drug problems, people excluded from the workforce, um, high school dropouts in programming, and the evidence is that um, uh, programming skills are eminently uh, trainable. Um, and, and, and so it, it, it does appear to be um, a, a, a tractable problem if we approach it in a different way. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and thank you, Joya, for all for, for this work. This is a very important work. Yeah, Antonia, over to you. Yeah, over to you. Yeah, no, I, think, I think lots of important points have been raised. Let me try also to uh, problematize some of these issues. I think we all agree that education is extremely important for social mobility, inclusiveness, and so on. But we also know that uh, uh, we cannot have an, a, an approach to skills development as an individual problem. Uh, people are productive as part of organizations. So if we do not have ways to rethink the way in which organizations and productive organizations work, the individual skills themselves, the education themselves, do not address the fundamental problem, also because, as we know, the nature of many of the technological changes changes we are seeing now uh, is uh, a, the nature of technology fusion across many different disciplinary and scientific areas, which means that it's very difficult to predict what are going to be the exact type of skill profile that you are going to uh, need. So to a certain extent, uh, there is this need for working both at the individual level, but also at the organizational level, to understand what forms of organizations will be better and forms of management of work will be better suited to address the, the new challenges. And again, I think you raised before this point around, I think Martin was mentioning about, you know, how do we think about new forms of thinking about management and representation? And I think this is an important area. The, the big topic of future of work is who is going to be involved in uh, designing these worlds of work, right? These new spaces where people uh, uh, you know, spend a large part of their life. Uh, how do we create forms of involvement? Uh, and you know, the experience from the past, if we think about mechanism of co-determination in the German system or form of employment, like in the case of Japan, that were sort of developed in order to provide people with uh, more certainty and more willingness to accept technological change, um, we're talking about the countries where, for example, robotization has, has gone ahead at uh, highest speed. Uh, we need to think about what are going to be the new forms of organization of uh, uh, world workforce that would allow to actually engage with this technology in a different way. And we are facing challenges. I mean, I, I've been looking, for example, at how uh, work council and collective bargaining in Germany itself has been declining uh, since 2000 dramatically, which means that 
very important model that showed uh, adaptability capacity of inclusiveness and, and so on uh, have probably uh, now need to be rethought and need to be integrated with this new type of challenges. The other set of points that I think were prompted by what Martin was saying, I think we, you know, there is increasing evidence that um, we should try to avoid as much as possible to get into this idea that we are uh, in the middle of a revolution that is disruptive everything, right? So to a certain extent, uh, even in the use of technologies like AI, there are a number of still challenges and the process is perhaps more incremental in terms of changing the nature of works and uh, uh, jobs uh, than people would think of. I mean, I'm, for example, uh, for some of you uh, interested, I mean, the MIT has just completed a, I think, two, three years research program on the future of work. And uh, part of the result is exactly trying to understand the heterogeneity of the way in which these things work and also how incremental and how much space we have actually to affect them and give them some directionality, which I think goes back to the original point here. So what we would like to see happening, uh, it's first of all, understanding the nature of this phenomenon, what are the entry points? Because I think we know that the complexity of the issue requires a sort of multi-pronged approach. It's not just regulation in one area. It's not just uh, job rights. It's not just uh, you know uh, getting quotas for people, people participation. It's about uh, rethinking the full package of policies and integrating them in a way that provide a type of directionality. And, you know, I've been doing work, for example, in South Africa in terms of looking at how you can integrate industrial competition policy in order to get the benefit, what Martin was referring to, of the digital technologies also in the public sector. But at the same time, you can actually avoid that uh, digital platform in particular or digital brands leads to further concentration and further concentration of power and so reduction in inclusiveness. I, I can't resist uh, responding to that, An Antonio, if I may. Um, so I think um, uh, I, I think there's a, a precedent, a pattern in the history of technology, which is um, uh, piloted by Carlos Perez and others, which says that basically technology doesn't create wealth and, and prosperity unless it's accompanied by um, a, a, an organizational change, a sociological change in, in how that technology is deployed. Um, as, as a business strategist, I very much see that in business. Um, so we can think about the corporations of today employing technology um, in order to create value and create work. Um, I think the evidence is that that's probably not going to work because the technologies we're talking about actually change the nature of the way that we produce, uh, the nature of what we produce and, and consume and how we communicate. So we have to actually change the, the fabric of a corporation. Um, and, and so that's a very important area, I think, which is what is a corporation, how does it work? And um, a couple of speculations on my part for, in, in relation to that. So I think we've been used to the idea that um, corporations pro produce things. Um, and it is true that uh, going back a few years, um, corporate success used to last for at least a decade. If you were successful, you'd likely continue to be successful. The decay rate of corporations now is about a year. Um, so in other words, just because you were successful yesterday does not mean that you'll be successful tomorrow, which means that we need to reconfigure corporations as machines which learn and adapt. So it all becomes about learning. So you basically need all, all corporate organizations which are geared for learning, not producing based upon yesterday's learning. And that's a very different type of organization. Um, secondly, um, what do we mean by organization? We may think about an organization as uh, an org chart, uh, a hierarchy of individuals segregated by roles. Uh, but actually, if white collar work is being um, taken over by AI, um, we need to reconceptualize the organization as a productive hybrid, a productive learning hybrid of humans and algorithms. Um, you know, what does the org chart for that look like? And, 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 and how, do we, how do we make that happen? So I think there's a, um, uh, there's a responsibility and an opportunity for, for corporate leaders here in order to generate work, we need to think about the organizations that create value, and those corporations need to rethink themselves. So hybrid learning organization, I think, is what we need to uh, define. And, and uh, there are a handful of companies that are making uh, enormous progress in that direction. But I think the majority of companies are not really thinking about uh, things in that way currently. 
Indeed. I want to come back to the segment you were talking, Martin, about corporate statesmanship and tie it with the point that Antonio was making about the directionality of technology. So the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose that where Antonio is uh, heading up research um, has done really a lot of work to help the world recognize the major positive role that governments can play in setting this directionality, driving innovation forward, often taking the most risk without much reward for that. But the problem with governments, if that's a problem, is that national governments are entities that uh, you know, are mandated to care for the well-being of a single nation, while technology, as we're witnessing, knows no borders. American innovators might automate the job to cut their costs um, in the U.S., labor costs in the U.S., but once it is automated here, um, the technology spread globally, often at virtually zero costs, and um, workers in poorer countries might not be able to compete with it, no matter how low they push their wages. So this speaks to this heterogeneity that Antonio was referring to, and that really the appropriate and needed technology is different for different countries. Um, so in this environment of borderless technology, should there be some kind of truly empowered international body that is mandated to ensure technology is poised to, sol to serve all people of the planet? And in an absence of such a body, um, are there additional responsibilities on the shoulders of technology companies? Because those are often international, while governments are not. Um, whoever wants to chime in on that, please. I think if you uh, allow me to, because you were mentioning before also the COVID, I think the COVID crisis has been accelerating patterns that we were already observing going on. But in doing that, in generating this acceleration has made clear uh, a number of these issues that you're referring to. So when I was talking about directionality, for example, uh, now people are aware of the fact that a technology that doesn't deliver in terms of resilience, in terms of robustness of systems, that allow to keep society cohesive and uh, able to respond to a pandemic, it's not a technology useful for all at all. Right? Um, now, if we think about COVID and we think about what we are learning about the problem of uh, who is going to produce the vaccine, where the vaccine is going, how it's going to be distributed, how developing countries are going to uh, get access to that and so on. We also realize that uh, while we do not have uh, uh, what you said, you know, the, 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 an easy way to make some of these technologies immediately uh, public goods. Uh, at the same time, we know that we have the possibility, and not, not referring just to drugs and the pharma side, but also the med tech side, uh, we have the possibility of promoting development of a key industry like the health sector in a number of countries in a much more distributed form, which would allow to have much more resilience across countries in the world in providing uh, the type of answer to things like pandemic without even entering now into the climate change side. And I think you know we've been discussing uh, about how difficult it was to scale up and ramp up production of uh, ventilators and then became masks and then became PPE and so on and so forth. Right? So it seems to me that this is an area where uh, the health sector and uh, med tech uh, so the broader med tech and biopharma can really become an important driver for uh, a more distributed form of development of technologies and adaptation of technologies in different country contexts, um, and also an important multiplier. Um, when we think about biomed tech, we are talking about lots of critical product system, which implies lots of linkages, lots of supply chain development, and also lots of adaptation at the institutional level context. And here, the government can really take the lead in shaping this direction. Because, uh, of course, the health sector implies a significant procurement uh, commitment by the government. And procurement could be a very important instrument to shape this much more distributed form of development and use of the technology in the med tech uh, sector. I, mean, I could say more about the climate change side. But I think in everyone's mind at the moment, there is this issue of how would be the current situation different if we had invested in developing uh, productive capabilities in pharma, med tech across several developing countries. And by the way, not losing these capabilities also in advanced economies, right? Because the fact that we had 
so many logistics problems, so many problems in addressing the crisis in the very beginning is partially the result of lacking and losing capabilities in critical areas. Uh, where actually uh, we realized you know, many of the, our well-being and, and the wealth of uh, the economy was, was based on. So I think this is an important moment where we can actually uh, innovate uh, both the technology and much more importantly at the organizational level in thinking how this can become an opportunity to actually open up a new, uh, I would say, I, I like to think about this sector as a multiplier of development in a number of uh, both developing countries and regions within developed countries where uh, the desertification of the productive system has led to unemployment, has led to populism, has led to a number of challenges we are facing now. I think just to build on that and think about the question of, you know, production of technology, if we think about something like AI, or even in your example around the vaccine and healthcare technology. Then we think about the governance. So how how is this being distributed? What are the rules and policies that dictate that? And I think back to your question of like a, a global technology council that's this kind of top-down body that's trying to equally distribute these things. The third leg of that stool that we haven't really touched on is this idea of trust. And that's been such a tremendous theme over the past year when we think about technology and how tools like social media have had this tremendous backlash um, because of how people perceive them interfering with democracy, for example, on the one side, or just being completely um, full of like false information. And even with something like the masks, like we could have ramped up the production and we could have mandated masks. And at the same time, many, many people didn't believe, didn't trust in this information. And so to me, you know, there's like, we can talk about how the governance and the regulation as well as the production side of things can impact um, kind of the distribution, <laughs> but what also affects the distribution is that trust. And I really wonder about that when we're talking about any kind of top-down solution, uh, whether it's like this global body or the government, and really thinking about something that might be more decentralized and grassroots and how we start to build that participation, because I think that participation builds trust. And that may look really different depending on how you look at it. It might be really grassroots. It might be education campaigns. It might be just people getting to speak out and, and feel heard in this space. But I think if we don't address that, any kind of policy or massive wide scale um, idea, it won't take root, especially in certain areas is what we're seeing. And so to me, that's one of the key issues we need to address. And I think, again, it has to do with very complex pieces, but one way is again thinking back to this like participation architecture how do we get more people to feel like they're contributing like they're part of the solution and that that does build the sense of trust for any kind of um, solutions that we want to roll out or feel like are go going to work for everybody but they won't if they don't accept it and and i think to me that's a very troubling um piece that isn't often talked about when we think about the solutions like governance and policies. Yeah, expanding on this idea of corporate statesmanship, um, you know, what do we mean by it? So, so there is a, clearly a role for government. Um, corporations can't be expected to self-regulate everything uh, in, the, in their own interest. Uh, you would have an enormous governance problem. However, there are problems with um, expecting too much of government for, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, current uh, uh, political divisiveness and fragmentation means that governments are not in their best position to respond to many of these issues. Uh, the speed of development uh, doesn't um, uh, mitigate towards uh, um, uh, a government taking prompt action. Um, asymmetry of information. Um, we don't have the best expertise on these new technologically related uh, externality issues uh, in, in government. Um, globality. Um, governments are national, not global. Um, 
um, corporations, many corporations are more global, and also the complexity of the issue, the fact that we're not dealing with one issue here, we're dealing with uh, maybe maybe 50 discrete um, uh, issues. So um, what, what is the role of the corporation in taking um, action beyond their own boundaries, um, either in their own enlightened self-interest or um, in, in the interests of the societies in which they're embedded? Um, you know, that's what I mean by corporate statesmanship. And I think some of the key elements of that, um, firstly, are to see that big picture, to say uh, that is absolutely a role for the corporation. The corporation must um, uh, shape its context. Um, so in biology, it's, it's, it's called niche formation. The, uh, in, 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 in new emerging businesses, uh, businesses have a, a role to play in shaping the environment in which they play as, as well as playing in that environment. Um, I think it's about expanding the canvas of consideration. So strategy traditionally has, has dealt mainly with issues of um, what you may call, um, you know, next door neighbor, next door neighbors, customers and competitors, uh, but not really uh, societies, uh, uh, regulators, um, and so on. Um, expanding the canvas, um, expanding the time scale of consideration. So not just the next quarter or the next year, but the um, the long-term consequences of um, uh, new social media models or, or whatever it happens to be. And then um, thinking about a more integrated way of thinking about those issues. So corporate social responsibility has played uh, an enormous um, role in uh, raising the interests of corporations in these, on these broader social issues. But you know, one of its principal drawbacks is it's not really baked into strategy. So it's almost like a parallel you know, co-optimization of social issues and business issues. So you get a lot of contradictions. Um, so um, uh, a more baked in way of thinking about um, uh, what I call sustainable business model innovation, where you actually think about uh, the, uh, the limits as you stretch um, and scale a business model and, and you, for sustainability and sustainable contribution, you actually think about baking those considerations into the strategy itself rather than into some parallel set of of, of, of corporate measures. Um, the final thing I'd say is, you know, when when corporations imply that in uh, apply that in line self interest, you know, I think there's a growing awareness that constraints are not entirely a bad thing. So I think traditionally, um, coming out of the era of, of, of Reaganomics and, and free market uh, ca capitalism, the idea was that um, uh, perhaps the common sense idea was that regulation was something to be resisted because it harmed, you know, corporate freedoms to uh, you know, to create value. Um, but uh, of course, without any constraints whatsoever, um, and, and Tess referred to a big one, which is we, you know, if we can't agree on what constitutes a, a fact, um, because we're all free to say whatever we like in whatever channels we like, then you start to erode the trust which affects the business of, of, of everybody. So, you, you know, I think corporations thinking about the constraints which operate in favor of a well-ordered and sustainable game, which is in their long-term self-interest as well as society uh, is an important uh, aspect of this. So I see, uh, hopefully, a future where uh, corporations will be, um, on, on a global basis, you know, lobbying for certain types of regulation which are both um, uh, socially necessary and in their own long-term self-interest. They become active shapers of the, of the corporate context. Um, so sometimes the debate is trivialized as, CEOs taking a stance or not on an issue. Um, taking, not taking a stance can seem irresponsible um, or amoral, and, and, and taking a stance can actually exacerbate an issue that is already um, uh, polarized. Um, but there are alternatives, of course. One can create platforms for dialogue. One can create fora for discussing new types of regulation. One can uh, lobby for certain types of uh, 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 re regulation. So all of that I call corporate statesmanship, and I think it's it's an emerging topic and emerging art that I think will be more important moving forwards. Let me just respond to one point, just Martin raised. I think we have the, the narrative around the state lack of capacity in terms of managing some of these processes. Actually, is a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that the more we ease in we make the state incapable, the more it will become incapable, right? And the more it stops doing the type of things that has to do, the, the worse it's going to be for the functioning of the economy. I think the narrative around the role of the state and how the state can set up a relationship with business enterprises that actually allow to maximize the, the type of symbiotic relationship that emerge 
is at the core of the idea of managing some form of industrial policy and regulatory power. And I think this is where uh, I think the, the, there is to be a, a profound shift, not just a cosmetic shift, but a profound shift in rebalancing the type of way in which we've been uh, engaging with the problem of how the state and the corporations interact. We have been seeing corporations have been completely incapable to deal with the, uh, with the, the uh, pandemic in many respects, and the state had to step in in many uh, areas, right? At the same time, we are in a situation where, as we said in the very beginning, the new technologies can allow the state to develop dynamic capabilities and new forms of engagement, which actually allow for addressing the kind of systemic problems and regulatory type problems that uh, I think Martin was also referring to. Uh, and I think there is an element of, you know, the uh, and I, I, I share what uh, Tess was mentioning. You know, how do you rebuild a social contract? Right? How do you rebuild a, a platform that allows people to beyond uh, some form of uh, uh, simple etiquette around what is the role of the public, what is the private, but actually allow a, a around specific problems to redefine missions or activities that actually are functional to the solution of the problem. And this can mean the new architecture of uh, governance that we are not still seeing happening. But, and this is why I'm saying, I think we should allow for a plurality of experimentation around how this platform of governance would work and uh, how it develop in different country contexts. Thank you. I want to move along to audience questions. We have quite a few really interesting ones. And because we only have I'm going to string them into themes and combine a few questions into one. So there is definitely a theme coming across about antitrust. What what role can it play in driving inclusive economic outcomes from uh, technological advancement as well as taxation? People are asking uh, our viewers how um, technologies can be inclusive if profits are being diverted into tax havens. Um, and also, there is a question around what um, what U.S. could learn in terms of regulation from Europe and from the U.K., um, which I think is especially relevant question on the eve of uh, the U.S. presidential inauguration. So, if anyone would like to comment on any of these aspects, please chime in. I'm not an expert in, in regulation, but just to comment on one aspect of that, which is um, so I think the the anti-monopoly issues of a lot, large part of the debate is, is focused around, you know, breaking up um, um, uh, the tech oligopolies. Um, you, you know, I, I would separate the, the creation of the benefit from the um, th from dealing with the side effects. And I, I think it's very important that we, you know, these many of the technologies and the benefits of digital platforms rely on the efficiency of of scale. Um, so I, I would, I, I think we think need to think more in the direction of the distribution of benefits rather than measures that may undermine the the the, uh, the, the ability to obtain those benefits uh, in in the uh, in in the first place. So this is the difference between saying, um, you know, e-commerce is too is too concentrated. Let's break it up. And uh, you know, we need to balance the efficiency of the model with um, you know rules about distribution of benefits, inclusiveness of, of, of partners and so on. I, I, I think going the second route is uh, in aggregate more, more, perhaps more productive from, from my perspective. Well, I think, I think the competition policy angle is we have been, I mean, the, 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 as the economy change and the platform type of structure becomes uh, the new forms of, you know, from the factory to the platform, some people have been saying, of course, the way in which we think about competition policy has, has to change as well, in the sense that we need to better understand what accounts for uh, abuse of dominant positions, what are the relevant markets, how we define all these different uh, uh, contexts. And in a sense, the problem here is to identify what is the optimal level of competition, which is not necessarily uh, trying to break all sorts of uh, 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 corporate structures that rely on technologies that have network effects that require agglomeration that will require some form of uh, uh, more uh, uh, global type of structure. The problem is more, you know, how, what are the instruments that we have? And what are the type of trends that we are seeing happening? And uh, for those of you interested, I mean, Oxford has this uh, initiative called Digital Pathways to Prosperity, where 
many of us have been wor working on trying to identify exactly how in different contexts competition policy, when it's used strategically and integrated with other types of regulatory measures, especially industrial policy, can actually become an instrument to unlock uh, uh, the kind of negative side of uh, extreme concentration while at the same time exploring the opportunities offered by digital technologies. I would say the other two bits where clearly we need to work more is how to think about corporate governance reforms, uh, because this is an area which affects dramatically the extent to which uh, the firm can be what Martin described, the learning uh, type of uh, uh, institutions, of organization, or platform, and the extent to which actually there is uh, financial uh, commitment of resources into technology innovation with a, a public type of purpose with proper directionality. Um, so I think these two are key areas that require rethinking in this new context of uh, technological change. I'm just quickly responding to that. I, I, I think regulatory innovation, I think the word innovation, I think we shouldn't rush to action on things that we need to, uh, to innovate around. If you think about competition policy traditionally, it's, it's got a couple of hidden assumptions. One of them is that it's mainly a national issue. Another one is it mainly concerns you know, issues of consumer harm. I think th th these networks, these, these policies don't apply easily to, um, say, e-commerce, where there is no obvious consumer harm. If there's harm, it's probably more more on the supply side and where you're dealing with um, where you're dealing with global issues. So we we absolutely need um, regulatory uh, in, innovation. So I think there's a lot um, perhaps that um, um, academics and politicians can do to put in place those uh, those that international collaboration around regulatory innovation on um, and this is a whole set of issues around uh, you know privacy, interpretability, unintended consequences. Um, uh, transparency uh, and, and so on, uh, so that we, we 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 have new ways of new more subtle ways of, of dealing with these issues, and some of them being perhaps technological solutions. Yeah, I wonder about how you know regulation can often, uh, in some places, um, be much slower to act and slower to make an impact. And in the implementation of that regulation, there can be all these unintended consequences to pull out a phrase that you used. And I think being continuing to be cautious and knowing that that's a slow vehicle and also one that is, um, you know, can, can bring opposite effects than what were intended. So I think we need to look outside of just regulation as a vehicle for change um, because of its speed, but also its inaccuracy in um, in solving these issues. So what are the other solutions that we can use that are faster and more decentralized um, and that really take into account you know, everyone's needs in terms of how the speed at which some of these changes are happening, how do we keep up with that in a way that is um, inclusive and really thoughtful about the implications and unintended consequences? These are really excellent points. I want to thank the panelists for the really insightful and very nuanced conversation today for not shying away from complexities and problematic aspects of the questions that we've been discussing and the questions that our audience has been submitting for us. Thank you all very much for joining. Uh, this discussion will now continue in an open forum with INET's Young Scholars. To join it, please click on the Young Scholars Initiative link at the bottom of the screen. The next episode of INET Live Future Work Series will feature Danny Roderick, Paulina Cherniva, and Laura Tyson, and will be moderated by Steve Clemens. They will discuss economic and social policy for the digital era. Save the date, it's January 26th at noon Eastern time. Please register on the INET's website if you haven't uh, done, that, done so yet. The link is to the right of this video on the INET. Page. Please follow INET Live at INET Economics to hear about new episodes of the Future of Work series. Thank you very much and see you next time.